Good afternoon, class. So for today, as we continue in Chapter 4, we are now going to be covering Chapter Section 4.3. Now, similarly to 4.2, this is still about, you know, bringing together everything we've learned so far, and how do we apply this to sketching. Now, in the previous lecture, we talked about how to sketch polynomial functions. So when you have the form of x squared plus x plus 1, or x cubed plus x squared minus x plus c, so on and so forth. Anything that takes on that format is a polynomial function, and in the previous lecture we talked about how to sketch those functions, those equations. So today, going along a similar kind of theme, our goal is to sketch rational functions. Now what are rational functions? Just a little refresher. Rational functions is when you have a polynomial function divided by another polynomial function, assuming the denominator is not zero. So let's, let's go ahead and get into it, and I'll go ahead and put the ref refreshers up here so you can see what I mean. So today we are in section 4.3, and... As we move forward, right, sketching rational functions, that's what we're after today. So, sketching rational functions. And what is a rational function? Uh, a rational function, f of x, is some polynomial, p of x, divided by some other polynomial, q of x, where q of x does not equal 0. And that's what we're talking about here. Now in terms of the steps, because in the previous video I gave you a list of, I believe it was 8 steps, yeah, 8 steps for how to, how, how to sketch these functions. Those same 8 steps are going to work here as well. So you want to look back at that lecture, look back at those eight steps. We're going to use those exact same steps here when we apply them to rational functions. The only difference is here, because we're dealing with a fraction, we now have to start talking about, okay, we need to make sure we keep track of vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and what are called oblique asymptotes. Now I know for this class we haven't talked about what oblique asymptotes are yet, but that'll be a part of today's lecture. So for starters, what is a vertical asymptote? Vertical asymptote. This is where your denominator, q of x, is equal to zero, but p of x does not equal to 0. So this is for some fixed x, x equals a, or whatever. Uh, if you can plug in some number and your denominator equals 0, but your numerator does not, then you have a vertical asymptote at that x value. Uh, case in point, remember the example we keep using in this class uh, where it's x plus 2 divided by x minus 1. Well, we couldn't simplify this any, but when you plug in 1, if you plug in 1, f of 1 is 3 divided by 0, which is bad. We can't do that. So we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. Okay, so far so good. Now what? Well, we've talked about vertical asymptotes. Now what about horizontal? Horizontal asymptotes. And again, as I stated in a previous lecture about how to calculate horizontal asymptotes, this is all about looking at the power, the, the highest degree power of your numerator and denominator. So what are the rules? How do we use this? Well, we have some possibilities. One, if q of x, that's our denominator, has the 
largest power, then y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. Why is that? Well, think about it. If q of x, our denominator, is the bigger power, and we have the bigger power in the denominator, then as x increases, your denominator is going to be increasing faster than the numerator. It has the largest power down here. And so if your denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger at a faster rate than the numerator, then as we talked about with limits, if you're dividing by a bigger and bigger number that's growing faster, when you divide by that bigger number, your answer in the long run is going to be zero. And so for the same reason, when you have a fraction with a denominator that has the largest power, then over time, our functions, or this particular function where we have the largest power in the denominator, it's going to approach the y equals zero line because it's going to it's going to flatten out to zero. So that's why you have a horizontal asymptote there. Case two, if q of x and p of x have equal powers, so they're growing at the same rate, then in that case, and this is actually a good example of it here, with our equation x plus 2 divided by x minus 1, in this case, when the powers are equal, then it's not going to go to 0. It's also not going to go off to infinity because we have equal powers. They're going to balance each other out. So what power does it go to? Or, I'm sorry, what asymptote does it go to? It goes to the y equals a divided by b line, where a and b are the coefficients, well, they're the, more specifically, the leading coefficients, meaning they're the coefficients attached to the biggest power x of p of x and q of x. So to look at our example here, if we look at the leading coefficients, we have 1 and 1. So the horizontal asymptote here occurs at 1 divided by 1, or just 1. So here we go, here's another asymptote. We've got a horizontal asymptote right there. So x, f of x, and there we go. So there's a vertical asymptote, there's a horizontal asymptote. And then for the third type, I had mentioned earlier that there's such a thing as what is called a oblique asymptote. What is an oblique asymptote? An oblique asymptote is, and let me make sure I copy this correctly. So these asymptotes are of the form y equals mx plus b. In other words, unlike the vertical or horizontal asymptotes, instead of it just being some straight line in the y-axis direction or the x-axis direction, this asymptote is some some other line that it could have any slope, it could have any intercept, it's a line that has the form mx plus b. But how do you find it? And how do you know that it's there? Well, you know that it's there because it occurs when p of x is one power larger. So in other words, the largest power for p of x is only one power larger than the denominator, q of x. And, so this is an important and here, it requires that not only does p of x have one power greater, and what else has to happen? It has to be that f of x can be simplified 
into some format where we have mx plus b plus p of x divided by q of x. And actually, this is some other numerator. This is different from this p. Because if we end up simplifying it, then we may have a different numerator. So if you can simplify and rewrite our rational function so that it's mx plus b plus some fraction, then in that case, we have an oblique asymptote. So there we go. Those are all three types of asymptotes we can have. Now in this case, they have equal powers, so the numerator does not have one power greater than the denominator. So there's no oblique asymptotes here. So we're good there. Nothing else to cover. Um, and now we're actually ready to complete the rest of this problem here. So let's see. And the last thing I would like to point out with the asymptotes here is that if you're worried about your horizontal asymptotes, take heart in the fact that a rational function can have at most one horizontal asymptote. So if you're worried about, well, what if there's others and I just didn't find them or I didn't calculate them or I didn't see them, don't worry about that too much. When it comes to rational functions, there can only ever be one horizontal asymptote. So don't worry too much about the horizontal ones with these special rules here. Uh, if there's one, there's only going to be one. And once you find it, you don't need to worry about it. So let that uh, put your mind at ease at least a little bit. Um, right. So now we have our asymptotes labeled. And once you have your asymptotes labeled for your rational functions, the rest of this problem uh, proceeds exactly how we did in 4.2. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean all that's left is to do what we did before and label your first derivative and label your second derivative. So we already know, well, no, we'll, we'll get there. So in order to start this, we need our first derivative and second derivative. So we're going to have to use quotient rule here. So f prime of x is equal to the derivative of the top, which is just 1, times the bottom, minus the top, times the derivative of the bottom, which is just 1, all divided by the bottom squared. And so we can simplify that a little bit. We're going to have x minus x. So they're going to cancel there. And then we're going to have negative 1 minus 2. So we're going to have negative 3 divided by x minus 1. So where does this equal 0? Well, this doesn't actually equal 0 anywhere. But where is it undefined? If I plug in x equals 1, I'll have negative 3 divided by 0, which is bad. That's undefined. So I have a critical point at x equals 1, which, based on my vertical asymptote I have here, makes sense. So we've got a critical point right there. And then to finish labeling either side of here, if I plug in, say, 2, then 2 minus 1 is 1, negative 3 divided by 1, is negative 3, so we are actually decreasing on the right side here. And you know what, let me double check this just to make sure I'm on the right track because something looks just a little bit off. Okay, so we're actually perfectly fine, we're on the right track here. Uh, the thing that was concerning me was that when I've drawn this graph in previous lectures, I've actually been drawing it... Uh, Inc well, I, I won't show you how to incorrectly draw it. <laughs> Point being, in some of the previous vid videos, I believe I was accidentally inverting it when I was graphing this guy. Uh, I, I didn't really check it to look too closely in the past. But based on what we're doing today, we are doing this correctly. And so we're actually going to see what this graph should look like. And the graphs I've drawn in the past for this guy is very similar looking, but what I was drawing was an inverted version. So I apologize for that in the past videos, but from this video, this is actually perfectly fine. We're on the right track. This is good, so we can keep moving forward. 
Okay, so right, we have a negative slope on this right side to the right of 1, and we are decreasing. What about the left side? We need to find out what's going on over here. So I'll just plug in 0 because it's a nice easy number. So 0 minus 1 is going to be negative 1. Negative 3 divided by a negative 1 is a positive 3. So we are increasing for values to the left of 1. Okay, great. Now what? Well, we next need to find our hypercritical points, which comes from our second derivative. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite our first derivative, except I'm going to bring the denominator up to the numerator. But I'm going to write it with a negative 1 power. By writing it like this, I now don't have to use the quotient rule again. Instead, written like this, I can just use the chain rule, which is actually a much easier rule to use when we're trying to take derivatives. So what is f double prime? Well, recall the chain rule says we leave the inside alone at first. The power comes down to the outside. So negative 1 times a negative 3 is a positive 3. We leave the inside alone, and then the power decreases by 1. So negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside part, which is just 1. So we actually have 3 divided by x minus 1 squared. And now to find our hypercritical points, we set this equal to 0. Now just as before, there's not actually any x that will make this 0, but what we have instead is a place where the second derivative is undefined. If I plug in 1, then I'm going to have 3 divided by 0, which is bad. I can't do that. So we have a hypercritical point at x equals 1. Okay, so so far so good. We have our critical points, we have our hypercritical points. We've labeled our intervals for increasing and decreasing. Now we need to label our intervals for concavity. So let's go ahead and do that. If I plug in, let's say, 2 to my second derivative, then I'm going to have 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 squared is 1, 3 divided by 1 is 3, so it's positive. And now if I plug in 0 on the left side for my second derivative, then I'm going to have 0 minus 1 is negative 1, negative 1 squared is positive 1, and then 3 divided by 1 is positive again. So I'm actually concave up, and you know what, I put positives here, but we've been using the up arrow to indicate concavity. So it's concave up on the right side, and it's also concave up on the left side. So Hmm, you know what? Hold on, let me double check this real quick. Okay, so I stand corrected. There actually was a mistake here. Uh, when I was doing my first derivative here and I had the quotient rule, I should have had my denominator squared. So simple mistake, easy thing to overlook. Uh, so don't feel bad if you are missing things, but just you. this is a good point that you just want to be careful when you're working through these derivatives especially when you're trying to do quotient rule with some fraction. You want to work it through it step by step and make sure you're not skipping anything like what I was doing. So be careful of that. Uh, so we've got our denominator squared for the first derivative. And so when I rewrote it, I should have had a negative 2 power over here. And then when I took the derivative, then the negative 2 would have come down. It would have had a positive 6 on the outside. The power would decrease by 1 to give me negative 3. And so my second derivative would actually have been 6 divided by x minus 1 cubed. And so we have this instead. Um, yeah, let me just double check that everything else is right here. 2 minus 1 is 1, that'd be a negative. I plug in a 0. Yeah, and over here to the left, this is also decreasing. So here, I just made a bunch of little mistakes here, and it threw off everything else I was doing. <laughs> uh, so right, here's our first derivative. If I plug in a 1 to my first derivative, well, I can't do that, but if I plug in 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 squared is 1, negative 3 divided by 1 is still negative, but if I plug in, say, 0, 0 minus 1 is a negative 1, but squared is a positive 1, so negative 3 divided by a positive 1 
is negative 3. So it's a negative on both sides. And we also have that for our second derivative, if I plug in 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 cubed is 1, 6 divided by 1, it's still positive, increasing on the right side. It's con concave up on the right side. And here for the left, when I plug in 0, I'm going to have 0 minus 1, so negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. And then 6 divided by negative 1 is negative. So we're actually concave down here to the right side. And now we're almost done. All that's left is to give me some points that I can place here. And then I'll use this information to graph the rest of it. So let's see. I would like a point at 0. And I'm just picking points that would be easy to calculate so I can label them and then draw the rest. So f of 0 is, let's see, that's 2 divided by negative 1. So I get negative 2. So at 0, I got a point here at negative 2. And then I'll plug in another point, let's say 2. Then f of 2 is going to be 2 plus 2 is 4. Uh, 2 minus 1 is 1, so I get 4 for my answer. So for 2, I go up to 1, 2, 3, 4. I got a point way up here. And now that I have these two points drawn, I can label the rest. So how do I do that? Well, for this right side where I have this point at 2, 4, I know it is decreasing and it's concave up. So it's decreasing and it's concave up. But I can't cross this asymptote, so it just has to get close to it. And to the left of this point, it's decreasing, so I'm decreasing as I come to it, but it's still concave up. So something like that, but be careful of this asymptote. Make sure you don't cross it. And there we go. And for the left side, it's going to be the same kind of deal. We see that it's decreasing and concave down. So decreasing, concave down, and then to the left of it, it's concave down, but it's decreasing as it approaches this point. And there you have it. So that is how you apply what we did in the previous section to rational functions. Really, the only difference here is that you want to calculate for your asymptotes first. Go ahead and label them on your graph so you don't accidentally cross them. Then once you have them labeled, then you follow through with the exact same steps we did in the previous lecture, where you find your critical points, find your hypercritical points, label your intervals for increasing and decreasing, label your intervals for concavity, and then the rest is history. You're golden from there, as long as you can label these correctly, and then you just need to draw the appropriate lines based on the labels you created. So not too bad, and this isn't too much of a jump from what we had in the previous section, only now, think about asymptotes. Okay, so there's our first example. Uh, let's take a look at a few other things in this section you might see. Um, in particular, I'm going to try to pick out an example that's going to give you an oblique asymptote, just so that you can see what that looks like and how to find it. And then we will go from there. So... Let's see what we've got for our first example. So, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, here we go. So, example one. Suppose f of x is equal to negative 3 divided by 2x plus 1. And now I want to do everything we just did. So first, I need to find asymptotes. Where do I have a vertical asymptote that's where the denominator is 0? So if I set 2x plus 1 equal to 0, I'm going to get x is negative 1 half. So if I plug in x equals negative 1 half, I'm going to have negative 3 divided by 0. That's undefined. So we have a vertical asymptote. vertical asymptote at x 
equals negative one half. Okay, let's keep going. What about horizontal asymptotes? Do we have any? Well, this is all about looking at what is the largest power for the numerator and denominator. Here in this case, the largest power is in the denominator. Well, according to this rule here, if the denominator has the largest power, then we're going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. In other words, as x gets really big, the function is going to get closer and closer to 0. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. OK. And then lastly, do we have any oblique asymptotes? Well, this is only going to happen when the numerator is one power larger than the denominator. Well, that doesn't happen in this case, so no oblique asymptotes. We can skip that. Nothing to worry about here. So we have our asymptotes. Now what? Well, now we're ready to address the rest of the question as we normally would. So we need to draw our graph. And let's see, that wasn't a very straight line. Let me try that again. So we need to draw our graph. And we should go ahead and label our asymptotes. So at x equals negative 1 half, negative 1 half, we have a vertical asymptote. So here we go. There's a vertical asymptote there. And then we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So here we go. Here's our horizontal at y equals 0. So we have our x-axis, our f of x-axis. We have them labeled, and now we're ready to start looking at the derivatives. So before we do that, I'm going to rewrite this function as negative 3 times 2x plus 1 raised to the negative first power. By rewriting it this way, then, the same as what we saw in the previous question, if I rewrite it like this with a negative power, then I can just apply my chain rule, and that's a lot easier to do. So, uh, let's see. Let me make. Uh, I want to make sure I leave room for my first derivative, and then I also want to leave room for my second derivative here to be labeled. And so now I'm going to come all the way down here, and I'm going to take my first derivative. So f prime of x, the negative one comes down. I'm going to have three on the outside. Leave the inside alone, 2x plus 1. Power decreases by 1, so it's negative 2, times the derivative of the inside part, so times 2. So I now have 6 divided by 2x plus 1 raised to the second power. And if I try to set this equal to 0, then I have the same problem as I did with the other fraction. There's no x that will make this fraction 0, but... I can make the denominator 0. If x equals negative 1 half, then 2 times negative 1 half is negative 1, plus 1 is 0. I would have 6 divided by 0, which is undefined. We can't do that. So we have a critical point at x equals negative 1 half. And that's a common theme you're going to be seeing as we work through this. Oftentimes, whatever your vertical asymptotes are, they're also going to be your critical points. Now, that may not always happen, but it's at least going to happen often. Uh, great. So there's our critical point. Now we need a label for uh, increasing and decreasing. So just plug in some numbers. If I plug in 0, that's to this right side, then I'm going to have 0 plus 1 is 1. 6 divided by 1, we're going to be positive on the right side. For the left side, Let's say I plug in negative 1. Well, negative 1 times 2 is a negative 2. Plus 1 is a negative 1. But when I square it, it's going to become positive. And so 6 divided by a positive, we're still increasing, even on this side. OK, so so far, so good. Now what? So we have our first derivative labeled. Now we need our second derivative. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm just going to use the chain rule again, save myself the headache. So the negative 2 
is going to come down, and I've already got the 6 on the outside, so I've got negative 12 times, leave the inside alone, 2x plus 1, power decreases by 1, so I've got negative 3 times the derivative of the inside part, so times 2. And now I have negative 12 divided by 2x plus 1 raised to the third. And again, if I try to set that equal to 0, then I have the same problem of there's no x I can plug in that will make this fraction 0, but I can still make it undefined when x equals negative 1 half. I'll get a 0 in the denominator, then I'll have negative 12 divided by 0. So there's our hypercritical point at the same x equals negative 1 half. And I'll do exactly what I just did, just plug in some numbers. So if I plug in 0, then I'm going to have 0 plus 1 is 1. Negative 12 divided by 1. So I'm going to be decreasing. I'm going to be concave down on the right side. And then for the left side, I'm going to be, let's see, I'll plug in negative 1. So negative 1 times 2 is a negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1 is a negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is still negative 1. So negative 12 divided by a negative 1 is actually positive. So I'm going to be concave up on the right side. And so, now that I have this labeled, I'm ready to start drawing some things. And the last thing we need to do here is I need some points to kind of build around. I need to know, you know, some starting points. This is part of the last step that we covered in the last lecture. So what are some points I can use? Well, I'll just pick some easy stuff like f of 0. So f of 0, I'm going to have negative 3 divided by 1. So it'll be negative 3. So at 0, I've got 1, 2, 3. I've got a point right here. And then if I plug in, let's say negative 1, then f of negative 1, that's going to be negative 3 divided by negative 1 times 2 is a negative 2, plus 1 is a negative 1. I'm actually going to have a positive 3. So for 1, I've got 1, 2, 3. I got a positive 3. And now that I have my points, all that's left is to use my labels down here to tell me how the graph is shaped. So for the right side where I have this 0, it's increasing, but it's concave down. Okay, so it's increasing, keep the curve facing downward, and then I approach my horizontal asymptote, but I don't cross it. And then here to the left of it, I had to increase to get to 0, but it's still concave down. And then same deal over here on the right. It's increasing, but concave up. So increasing, concave up. And then I had to increase to get up to this point, because it's all increasing on this side. But it's still concave up, so I've got something like that. And there we have it. That is your final answer for this question. Um, yeah, so again, this is very much the same step-by-step -step for what we were doing in the last chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, last chapter section. So it's the same thing. The only difference is that you want to check for these horizontal and vertical asymptotes first. Once you have them labeled on your graph, then the rest is the exact same thing. Label some points, find where things change, and then you're home free. Um, so there we go. Uh, the last example I wanted to talk about with this lecture is to give you an example where we have an oblique asymptote. What is an oblique asymptote? What does it look like? How do we find it? And then how do we apply it to solving these kind of questions? So here we go. And for this final example, we're going to be looking at uh, this guy right here. So f of x is equal to 2x squared minus x minus 3 
divided by negative x minus 3. Okay, and let me just back up for a moment and make sure I've got this right before I just write something on my board. All right, I'm back. So I paused the video just now just because uh, I knew there were a few different ways that you can solve for the uh, oblique asymptote in this case. However, the problem is that with the different methods you can use, uh, one of the methods, or at least the one that I found that actually worked here, is a method we haven't uh, really learned yet in this class. Um, it is useful and it is something you should probably learn, so we'll go ahead and apply that. I don't know for a fact if Hawks Learning is going to be expecting you to do these kind of problems or not. If they are, uh, let me know. We can talk about it, work through them. Um, but the method I'm about to show you that will help you get to what we're after um, is also going to help you get to the final answer uh, if you do this correctly. So, if we given this question, we're trying to find asymptotes. Well, the first thing is, let's go ahead and check for vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes occur where the denominator is 0, but the numerator is not. So I'll just take my denominator, negative x minus 3, and set it equal to 0. So I'll have negative x is equal to 3, or in other words, x is negative 3. Now if I plug in negative 3 to my numerator, or in general if I just plug it in for my fu function, then negative 3 squared is going to be 9, times 2 is 18, uh, minus negative is plus 3, so it'll be 21. For the minus 3, that's just 18. And then when I plug in negative 3 down here, uh, negative 3 with a double negative, that's a positive 3. Positive 3 minus 3 is 0, so I get 18 divided by 0. So I have a, oops, not horizontal, I have a vertical asymptote. at x equals negative 3. Now the next question is, do we have any horizontal ha asymptotes? Horizontal asymptotes occur where, one, the denominator has the largest power. Well, that doesn't happen here, so scratch that. Two, if the numerator and denominator have equal powers. Well, that doesn't happen either, so scratch that. And then, in the third case, Oh, you know what? I forgot to label the third case. In the third case, if the largest power, sorry about that, if the largest power is in p of x, the numerator, if the largest power is in the numerator, then there is no horizontal asymptote. And that's just because it means that the numerator is increasing at a faster rate than the numerator. And so as it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger at a faster rate, this denominator is not growing at the same rate. And so in the long run, as x increases, the denominator doesn't really matter. And so the numerator is just going to take over and go off to infinity in whatever direction it chooses. So in that case, there's no horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so that's our next question. No horizontal asymptotes. Okay, and then thirdly, we need to talk about oblique asymptotes. And this is where we have to use a different method that we haven't talked about in this class yet. So, the thing to do here is, if we can rewrite it in this format where it's mx plus b and then plus some other fraction, then that's good, that's what we want. In order to do that, we should try actually dividing this fraction. So recall that when we have, uh, like if you have 240 divided by 8, how would we solve this? Well, you could type it into a calculator, but if you're doing it by hand, then you could write it like this, and you say, okay, does 8 go into 2? No. Okay, does 8 go into 24? Yeah. That's 3. 3 times 8 is 24. So we subtract 
Uh, the zero comes down. Does eight go into zero? No, it's just zero. So we just put a zero there, and our answer is 30. And so 20, 200, bleh, sorry, 240 divided by eight is 30. Using that same kind of process of division and solving division like that, we're going to do the exact same thing for this guy. And that it may be a little scary to think about, but we'll walk through it step by step. And once you learn it, it's really not so bad. So 2x squared minus x minus 3 divided by negative x minus 3. Now the trick whenever you're trying to do division like this with uh, functions, just look at whatever x is the highest power and always be checking that against what you have on the inside. So let's go step by step. The whole point is that we want to multiply this negative x times something so that we'll get what we have under here so that when we subtract, it'll cancel out like what we had with our regular numbers. So when we do this, negative x times what will give us 2x squared? Well, I need a positive 2. So if I multiply by a negative 2, negative 2 times a negative, that'll give me a positive. But I also need an x squared. So if I multiply by x here, then when I do this, and keep in mind that when I'm dividing here, this is in parentheses. So when I take whatever I have up here and I multiply it, I've got to distribute against both of these guys. So let's check it. Negative 2x times a negative x, that's going to give us a positive 2x squared. And now I've got to distribute to the other guy. So negative 2x times negative 3 is going to be a positive 6x. Okay, so far so good. I've multiplied it, now I'm ready to subtract. Now when this subtraction, this is also distributive. I'm, distrib I'm subtracting this entire quantity here, so I need to distribute this negative to both of these guys. So 2x squared minus 2x squared, they're going to cancel. And then here I'm going to have negative x minus 6x, which is just negative 7x. And then bring our minus 3 down, the same as we did over here. Okay, so let's keep going. Negative 7x. Well, I've got a negative x, so if I multiply it by a positive 7, so plus 7, then I'm going to have 7 times a negative x is negative 7x, which is good, that's what I want. And then 7 times a negative 3 will be negative 21. So now I'm ready to subtract. Make sure you distribute your negative here. So negative 7x plus 7x are going to cancel, and then negative 3x plus 21, or in other words, or I'm sorry, negative 3 plus 21, or in other words, 21 minus 3, that's just 18. And so what do I have now? Well, how many times can x go into 18? Well, there's no x here. This is just an 18. So we've divided as far as we can, and this is now my remainder. I have a remainder of 18. If you think about going back to uh, elementary school and middle school when you learned about how to do long division and they would ask you find the remainder, that trick there and that uh, skill you learned then is going to come in handy here for these kind of questions. We have a remainder of 18. So what does that mean? That means this fraction is equal to, so when we divide this, we get this guy, what we have here for our answer, negative 2x plus 7, plus a remainder. But what is the remainder? Well, that's a remainder out of negative x minus 3. That was a remainder we couldn't divide out any further. And so that's left on the end, and we can rewrite the function like this. And so these are equivalent equations. They are the same thing. I've just rewritten it. But now that I have it written like this, here's my mx plus b. And so we have a oblique asymptote at y equals negative 2x plus 7. And there you have it. So then to solve the rest of this question, you want to label your vertical asymptote Label your oblique asymptote, so you got dotted lines in your graph. And then all that's left is to find your first derivative, find your second derivative, 
label the points, find where things change, and then go on your merry way the same as we did in the previous section. So there you have it. There's an example of a function that will have an oblique asymptote, and this is one way for how you can solve to find what is the oblique asymptote. And this division thing, the first time you see it may look very tricky, uh, but really it's not so bad once you practice it a little bit. And this is just like how we do normal regular division with numbers, except we have some variables thrown into. So don't worry about it too much. Um, I don't think there's a lot of questions that are going to be like this, but in case Hawks Learning does throw any at you like it, then at least you'll know how to do it. So, there you go. Uh, so that's all I had for today. That covers section 4.3. You guys are now fully equipped to sketch any polynomial function and any rational function. So I hope that helps. Um, of course, by all means, if you have any questions, concerns, don't hesitate to email me. We can talk about it. Uh, we also have the Q&A later in the day. So by all means, bring your questions to that, and we'll talk about any other concerns you may have. Otherwise, that's everything, and I wish you the best of luck.